This quickly brings up the speed of where we were at last time, just by quick review. So uh, last week we talked about Israel became a nation instead of a family while in captivity for 400 years. And they were led by theocratic rule. What's a theocracy? God's ruling them, okay? And then after that, then there was a monarchy and it was established there were three kings. The three kings were Saul, David, and Solomon, okay? And then under Solomon's son, who was it? Rehoboam, the kingdom was divided, and the northern kingdom of Israel was ruled by 19 kings until 931 BC, and he fell in what year? 722 <laughs> yeah, I always give the answer before you come up with the answer. So, 722 BC. So these are good things to remember. Okay, then uh, we, we talked about, after that, the, 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 the northern kingdom was the ten tribes. Who, was, who made up the southern kingdom of Judah? Judah and Benjamin. Benjamin, you are correct, okay? So those were, those were the southern tribes, okay? Now, did Rehoboam learn from his father's mistake? No, okay, no he didn't. And then, but Judah would experience five major revivals. So we're going to start looking at them uh, today. We looked at them last week, I suppose, as well. So the first king was King Asa, and he led them in a revival, but it was a partial revival. Why was there only partial revival? Does anybody remember? What did he not remove? He didn't remove the high places. That is correct. Okay, and uh, he he had three major accomplishments. Okay, Do, does anybody remember? This is a big ask. Do you remember what the three accomplishments were by King Asa? What did he do? He removed his mother. Wow, that's a big move. He removed his mama from being queen because of why? What was she doing wrong? She was worshiping false gods. She was idolatrous. Second thing, what, did, what else did he do? He removed the strange gods. He took away the altars and the strange gods. Yes. And then the third thing, what else did he do? He led Israel to what? In a covenant to seek the Lord. Absolutely. So those are the three things. And then during his reign, what happened? People came down from what? The north down to the south. Okay. Why? Why did they come from the north to the south? There was a phrase we used there last week. Do you remember what it was? What did they see about Asa? The Lord was with them, or with him, with them. That's exactly right. With him, isn't it? Right. Okay. And then he had a battle against which country? Ethiopia. Did he win? Why? Why did he win that battle? Because God fought from him, he relied on the Lord. And then he had another battle. Does anybody remember that? Actually, I made changes to the other slides. I'm going to bring them down here. Okay, but even, anyway, there's only minor changes. It's fine. Um, so, uh, who, who did he not rely on the Lord to fight? The Northern Kingdom of Israel. Remember that? Okay. Basha, wasn't it? Basha, King of Israel, came against them. And uh, he did not rely on the Lord for the second time. First Chronicles chapter 16. That was last week. Then we talked about the second king, Jehoshaphat, one of my favorite kings, great king. He was the son of Asa. And um, he, who does Jehoshaphat compare with? David. David. That's exactly right. And uh, he took away the high places and the groves out of Judah. And uh, what did, what, where, what, why did Jehoshaphat send the Levites throughout the land? What was he? What was he wanted to teach the people? The law. the law of God. That's exactly right. Okay, he wanted to teach the people the law of the Lord. That's wonderful. But he had a big mistake. Even great men of God make big mistakes. What was his big mistake? And how did he king up? Team up with King Ahab? There's so three different ways he did. Oh, he recognized also his son, right? Right. Those, yeah, he made. So, he, so a war alliance. And also, he, his, his, his uh, son, he married his son off to the king. What was Ahab's daughter's name? Does anybody remember? Athaliah. A really bad, yeah. Jezebel was Ahab's wife. They had a daughter called Athaliah. Two of the most wicked women in the Bible related to King Ahab. Wow. Wow. What a, a legacy he had. Okay. But God did not want the righteous teaming up with the wicked. And who did he send to warn Jehoshaphat? Remember the prophet's name? One of my favorites. I'll give you a clue. Um, King Ahab says, I hate him. 
Micaiah, Micaiah, you are right. Micaiah, 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 whatever, wherever he says. Anyway, so, so that was last week. So we won't probably problem. Now, let's deal with this week. Turn your Bibles to where we go. Second Chronicles chapter 22, please. Second Chronicles chapter 22. Second Chronicles chapter 22. So, um, we're now going to talk about this daughter of Ahab. Her name is again? Athaliah. Okay. Um, hold on. Yes. So, it's a few. Second Chronicles chapter 22, verse 10. The Bible says, But when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she arose. I think it was, that was Jehoram, wasn't it? Was that her, her son? I can't remember anymore. But anyway, um, she arose, and the Bible says, and she destroyed all the seed royal of the house of Judah. Wow. That's how wicked she was. She, she was so ruthless, so power hungry, she was going to kill everybody in her way of power, even her own children. Wow. She was wicked, wasn't she? Okay. So, no, this was actually, uh, saw her son, sorry, the mother of Ahaziah, saw her son was dead, Ahaziah. That, why am I saying Jehoram? The name's right there, Ahaziah. So this was, she was a very, very evil woman. Now, let's talk about her for a second. At this point, uh, or at the point at which Joash was rescued, sorry, at this point, this is badly worded, Joash was rescued by his godly aunt Jehoshaphat and her husband, faithful priest Jehoiada. Second Chronicles chapter 22, verse 11 and 12. Let's read that. But Jehoshaphat, the daughter of the king, took Joash, the son of Ahaziah. So this is a sister and a brother situation. So Joash was obviously the youngest brother and stole him from among the king's sons that were slain and put him and his nurse in a bedchamber, which is like a bedroom. So Jehoshaphat, the daughter of King Jehoram, the wife of Jehoiada the priest, for she was a sister of Ahaziah. Okay, so um, let, let's, let's get this right now. She was a sister of Ahaziah, so this was an aunt situation, wasn't it? And she hid him from Athaliah so that she slew him not. And, she, and he was with them, hid in the house of God, six years, and Athaliah reigned over the land. Six years of terror. Who does that remind you in more recent history? Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein, maybe? Who else does that remind you of? Hitler. Hitler. It reminds me of Bloody Mary. Remember oh, killing every yeah. six, was it six years or seven years of terror? I think she had six years of terror. You know, just killing everybody in her mouth. Wow. This is just unbelievable. This was some woman, okay? Now, he, this is Joash, we're talking about Joash now, was the only remaining heir to the throne. Now, why could Joash not die? He one reason why Joash could not die. He's the godly seed. He's the godly seed. God had promised. God had made a promise to who? To that. Well, before that? Abraham. Abraham. Who else? Isaac. Who else? Jacob. And then through to, then down to Drew David. You're exactly right. So God had made all those promises, and God was not going to break his promises. So he was a descendant of David. He was a direct line uh, of the Messiah. Okay? And had Satan succeeded in his plan, God's promise of the seed of the woman to Adam and Eve and of the blessing to all families of the earth, to Abraham, and of an eternal heir to David's throne, all these promises which we've been talking about would have been broken. Of course, God is more powerful than Satan. Aren't you glad about that? Now remember, God's covenants with Adam, Abraham, and David were unconditional. Regardless of the failure of mankind or efforts of Satan, God would overrule and ensure that the repeated promise to the Redeemer was kept. So, let's move on from Athaliah. Now, there's some story, it's worth reading, that Joash was rescued. We talked about that. He ruled then from 835 to 9, uh, 796 BC, according to 2 Chronicles chapter 24. Let's go there. Now, how old was Joash when he became king? So. Seven years of age, okay? So, 2 Chronicles chapter 24, verse 1. Who wants to read that? Joas was seven years old when he began to reign, and he reigned forty years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name also was the Sibia of Bethlehem. Okay, thank you. So, in order to raise donations 
to repair uh, the temple, Josh had a chest made for the people to put their donations into. So Josh did some good things. Let's look at 2 Chronicles 24, verse 8 to 11. And at the king's commandment, they made a chest and set it without, uh, at the gate of the house of the Lord. And they made a proclamation throughout Judah and Jerusalem to bring in to the Lord the collection that Moses, the servant of God, laid upon Israel in the wilderness. And all the princes and all the people rejoiced and brought in and cast into the chest until they had made an end. Now it came to pass that at what time the chest was brought into the king's office by the hand of the Levites, and when they saw that there was much money, the king's scribe and the high priest officers came and emptied the chest, took it, and carried it to his place again. Those did they day by day and gathered money in abundance. So it's tremendous things. People got behind the temple worship. Do you know people get behind the cause? People always get behind the cause. They just do. So you need to write causes in front of people. Does that make sense? So this is a good, good cause here. Now, according to 2 Chronicles chapter 24, verse 2, who influenced Joash to do right all the time? Who influenced the priest? Who? the priest. That's exactly right. 2 Chronicles chapter 24, verse 2. Who wants to read that? And so all the days of Jehoiada, Joash did what the right thing, and after the death of Jehoiada, then Joash unfortunately lapsed into idol worship. Do you know why he did? Does anybody want to um, suggest why Joash lapsed into idolatry after Jehoiada died? And there's several reasons. So let's list some of those reasons. Because it was Jehoiada, the priest that had been guiding him. Right. And his mentor. So Jehoiada was his mentor. He, brethren, sometimes people will do right as long as they're around you because they feel like they owe it to you. Does that make sense? Because maybe you've been such a blessing in their life, you've been such a help in their life, and they feel like they owe it to you to do what's right. But the problem is it's not in their heart. Do you understand what I'm saying? Be, be wary, young people, that you're not just doing right because your parents are leading you to do right. Make a, a decision of your own heart that you will do right before the Lord because you want to do right before the Lord. Get your own relationship with God. Make the God of your fathers your God. Does that make sense? To use a biblical phrase. That's really important. Why else did Jehoiada also lapse into idolatry? So that was one reason. What did I say? Did I say Jehoiada? Yeah. I'm sorry. Why else did Joash, thank you, why else did Joash lapse into idolatry? There's another reason. I don't know whether he destroyed all those, uh, the groove and everything before he yeah. didn't power, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so he didn't go after the groves. So there was always that temptation. There was, there was always that influence of wickedness around him. Okay, okay, that's true. Why else did Joash? So that's another reason. There's, there's, there are multiple reasons. We were trying to look at this. Why else did Joash fall, fall into idolatry? He had no one to be accountable. He had no one to be accountable to. Isn't that interesting? And you know what's really important, and that really matches up, la, la, latches up to a point I wanted to make on this. His friends were wicked. His friends, those people he surrounded himself were idolaters and wanted idolatry. And so when, jo when, when, when um, Jehoiada was gone, then the person who was influencing them to do right was gone, and there was no younger people with a heart for God that were being raised up with George. Does that make sense? So again, young people, be very, very careful the friends you make, because the people you make as your friends are the people who are going to influence you. Make sure you're being influenced in the right way. Does that make sense? Surround yourself with the right people that are going to encourage you to do right. Joash did not do that. And that's not just for young people, by the way, that's for all of us. Yeah. That's, yeah, like the American system, there's a lot of wisdom. The Irish system is meant to have the checks and balances because, the, but the, but to be honest with you, it's it's just a the president really isn't really a check and check and balance for this country, really is he? You know, because he doesn't really uh, hold the government in 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 
Well, we've just appointed, set up a judicial commission to, uh, to investigate pointing of Georgia, and that's a, a, a reaction, a direct reaction to the imbalanced system in America, which is producing such rotten results at the moment. So, that's interesting. So, uh, and can I just say this? I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. You know, when you're talking about the imbalance, American system, it, it only works. And, and which president was it that said, one of the four founding fathers of America said, it'll only work if God is the center. When you remove the Lord out of society, there's no, uh, there's, there is no societal rule that will ever work. There's no government that will ever work. Because God has to be the center. Now, Ireland, God was not the center of Ireland, but Catholicism was the center of Ireland for, for centuries. And the fear of God was there, and so there was a form of righteousness there that blessed the people. Would you agree with that? You remove Catholicism and you, you, re, you replace it with secular wickedness and, and new morality. And so the, the reason why we have so many problems in our, in our country is because the government don't care about the people. And the reason why the government don't care about the people is because the people don't care about God. If people turn back and repent and say, God, we, we threw it the baby with the bath water, we know and the Catholicism let us down, Catholicism has done wrong, but God, you are righteous and you've never done wrong. We've sinned against you. We repent of the laws we have voted in and the people we voted in who are wicked, we ask you to for, to, for forgiveness. I think then God will start to bless our country again. I think we need that type of repentance. I, I'm glad we sung that song, Revivals, again. I think, I think well, what, was that? what song did we sing about revival? Was that? Did we see that today? We, yeah, 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 yeah. It was one of those songs, anyway. But yeah, because we need revival, don't we? We need a work of God's Holy Spirit in people's lives. I think, sorry, Pastor. I think there are people now developing their own standard of morality. Yes. Your standard might be different to mine, and different to someone else. Yeah. And I think we need to look at that and see what God wants us to do. Do you know why? Standard is the highest that we should. Do you know why people develop their own standard of morality? Well, that's one reason, but why else do people develop their own standard of morality? That's, a, that's true, but why else do people develop their own standard of morality? Well, when a, when a wicked reigns, um, the land is punished, and there's people who see just through my, anarchy happening. There is anarchy that's happening, that's exactly what's happening. That's everywhere. I'm not, it's, I'm it's everywhere. everywhere. It's, it's, it's the Western it's world is falling into yes. anarchy. Yeah. Because you're removing God away from the picture. But let me just say, the reason why is because they've removed God's standard. And if you remove God's standard, then you're going to replace it with your own standard. And our standard is never better than God's. No, no. It's always worse. And our standard never blesses people. It always frustrates people and grieves people. And although people are want to cast off God out of this country, the, ble the blessing hasn't come. We're not better off. I can tell you. Do you, know this, do you know what the solution to the housing crisis is? The fear of the Lord. Do you know what the solution to the medical crisis is? The fear of the Lord. We don't need any more money. We don't. It's not a money issue. It's a fear of God issue. Do you know the solution to the immigration crisis that we're facing right now is? The fear of the Lord. You start fearing God. I just read about today about, about a man, a temporary a pensioner. He built a log cabin on his land because he couldn't afford to live anywhere else. Because he was living in a mobile home and it was too cold in winter. So he built a log cabin with the help of neighbours. And the, the, and, and the county council wanted to put him in prison for four months for building a log cabin on his house. That's wickedness. I don't care what way you look at it. You may say, well, he didn't fill, fulfill the codes. We are in a housing crisis. And I think those councillors should go to prison for four months. Honestly. Honestly, it's wrong. It's wrong to treat people that way. But if you fear God, you won't do stuff like that. And if you don't fear God, do, does that make sense? I don't want to get into politics. But I want to talk, what we're talking about is people. We're talking about people's lives. We're talking about a fear of God. The fear of the Lord causes you to make the right decisions. And we need the fear of God back again. And you remove the fear of God. People can say no, 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 no to the referendum going up, but if they don't fear God, they don't know why they're saying no. A lot of people are saying no, no. I'm talking to people on the street, and most people I'm talking to are saying, I'm going to vote no. And the reason why they're voting no is because they have a clue why they should vote yes. And don't see any value in voting yes. Well, that's a good reason for start. But the thing is, people need to know why they know why. And, and you know, brethren, the fear of God fixes. Is everything. Would you agree with that? Yes, That's what we need to fear the Lord. Now, after the death of Jehoiada, 
Joash lapsed into idol worship. In fact, he even sanctioned the stoning of Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada. I just think that's very sad. Because he was his peer pressure, the peer, this was peer pressure. That his peers wanted Jehoiada's son killed. And the very man who rescued his life, who put him in power, uh, his son was put to death because of his peers. That's, that's pretty sad. And then when Jehoiada's uh, son, Zechariah, spoke out against this new apostasy, 2 Chronicles chapter 24, verse 20 to 22, it says this, verse 20, and, and the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada the priest, which stood above the people, and said unto them, Thus saith the Lord, Right transgress ye the commandments of the Lord, that ye cannot, ye cannot prosper, because ye have forsaken the Lord, he has also forsaken you. It takes a spirit-filled man to tell people what they need to hear, not what they want to hear. Anyone can play politics when it comes to pulpiteering. Anyone can. But I want to tell you something. It takes a spirit-filled man to tell people what they need to hear. Thank God for Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada. He was a spirit-filled man. Verse 21. And they conspired against him. When, when spirit-filled men preached the, in the power of the Holy Spirit, there was two responses, either revival or riot. There was no revival here, so there was a riot here, and they, and they stoned him, verse 21, with stones at the commandment of the king in the court of the house of the Lord. Thus Josh the king remembered not the kindness which Jehoiada his father had done to him, but slew his son. And when he died, he said, the Lord look upon it and require it. Wow. Wow. Okay, so that's Joash. Not a great king, I think we understand that. He only did right as long as Jehoiada was around. And ultimately, Josh was assassinated by his own servants in his own bed in verse 25 and 26 of chapter 24. And when they were departed from him, for they had left him in great diseases, his own servants conspired against him for the blood of the sons of Jehoiada the priest, and slew him on his bed, and he died, and they buried him in the city of David. And you know, all these honor, ki honor killings started to happen. You killed my people, I'm going to kill you. It was like gangland killings that was going on. Do you understand what I'm saying? All that was going on, not a blessed country. A country is never blessed when they turn away from God. Okay, But remind ourselves, God's promises are unconditional. Praise God for that. And Joash was just a child, and he began to repair the temple, and he was influenced by Jehoiada, and now let's talk about King Hezekiah. King Hezekiah, another one of my favorite kings, tremendous man of God. Three of the four kings between Joash and Hezekiah were mostly good kings, they did not, however, lead the people into the kinds of revivals led by the five kings who were highlighted. Okay, now, let's talk about what's going on during the time of Hezekiah. 776 BC, the first Olympic Games. There you go. 753 BC, traditional date for the founding of Rome. 722 BC, what happened in 722 BC? was taken in by, into captivity by Assyria. Good. And 700, well it wasn't good, but it's good to remember. 700 BC, Homer writes the Iliad and Odyssey. Okay? So that's around 700 BC. Okay. Now, let's go, I love this, I love this king. Okay? Let's go to 2 Kings 18 verse 5. Again, these are parallel passages. 2 Kings 18 verse 5. I love looking at the life of good men. 2 Kings 18 verse 5. We're looking at Hezekiah here now. 2 Kings 18, verse 5. Beginning in the first month of his reign, bread, when he led his people in revival. Isn't that a wonderful thing? What a legacy, okay? He immediately led a revival. 2 Kings 8, 18, verse 5. He trusted in the Lord God of Israel, listen to this, so that after him was none like unto him, among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him. So he was a great, great, great king. In 2 Kings 18, 5, we're told uh, about that. And after conquering the northern king of uh, Israel, Sennacherib, Sennacherib, I don't know how to say his name, but um, he invaded uh, Judah. And when he invaded Judah, who did Hezekiah find encouragement from? What man did Hezekiah find encouragement from? I'll give you four options to see if you know what it is. It was Elisha, Joel, Ezekiel, or Isaiah? Elijah. 
Isaiah. Isaiah 101. Isaiah Elijah was an option. <laughs> Elisha, Joel, Ezekiel, or Isaiah. It was actually Isaiah. It one of my favorite passages. 2 Kings chapter 19. 2 Kings chapter 19. Look at verse 5. Look what it says here. So the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah. And Isaiah said unto them, Thus shall he say to your master, Thus saith the Lord, Be not afraid of the words which thou hast heard, with which the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Behold, I will send a blast upon him, and he shall hear a rumor, and shall return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. Contrast Hezekiah with Joash. Joash made friends with idolaters. Hezekiah made friendship with who? The man of God, Isaiah. Isn't that encouraging? And you see, they have two different ends. Hezekiah, God used Hezekiah in a tremendous, tremendous way. Now, he wasn't always wise. He made some foolish decisions, okay, along the way, like we all do. But the point is, God used him in a great way. He saw revival. Brethren, he saw miracles happen. His name is recorded in history as a great man of God. That's tremendous, isn't it? Why? Because he made, he chose the right people to be around. Do you understand? Because, listen, we all get weak at times. I've seen people uh, on the edge and they could have gone one way or the other and they made their friends with the wrong people and they've fallen over the edge. I've seen people on the edge go one way or the other and they made their friends with the right people and they, they didn't fall over the edge, they got closer and further away from the cliff. Do you understand what I'm saying? It, our friends make a massive difference in our lives because brethren, we're all weak and we all struggle at times, all of us. There's no one in this room who doesn't struggle at times. Am I right about that? That's why it's so important to surround yourself with people who will encourage you in the right way when you're struggling. Does that make sense? That was a lot. That was Hezekiah. In the 14th year of Hezekiah's reign, Sennacherib, 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 let's go with that, that sounds good, invaded northern Judah. In an effort to pursue peace, Hezekiah paid Sennacherib tribute from the treasury, from the temple. Not a good idea, not a position of faith. Hezekiah didn't always do what was right. He panicked. Do you ever panic? When we panic, do we make good decisions or bad decisions? Usually bad. Usually bad, okay? We don't normally panic into the arms of the Lord. Do you understand what I'm saying? We often panic and make it a, a knee, have a knee-jerk reaction that gets ourselves in trouble. But you know what? A wise person after they panic and make a bad decision will run to the arms of the Lord. Are you with me here? That was Hezekiah. I'm glad for Hezekiah. So, giving the money from the temple treasury only temporarily uh, sent Sennacherib away, and, and it wouldn't deter the Assyrians from their desire of conquest. They wanted Judah. After sending to Isaiah to seek the Lord's help and obtaining assurance of deliverance, Hezekiah appealed further to the Lord. Look, I love his prayer, brethren. When you have time, read through his prayer, but look at verse 35. 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 35. Look at it says in verse 35 here. And it came to pass that night. Now, I love this because we don't have time to read it, but what Hezekiah did is he, he, he took a, a letter from Sennacherib and he laid it down before the Lord. And he said, God, this is what he said. And he brought it before the Lord. He said, Lord, please do something about that. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever done that? When somebody gave you a letter or you had a piece of document in your hand and, and it troubled you, have you ever put it down before the Lord and got on your face before God and said, God, look what this says. Help me here. Because I have. And do you know what? I worship a God who answers prayer. Amen. Actually, I remember now doing electronics in college, doing business, management science and industrial system studies, and you'd be given electronics. That was a paper I brought before the Lord. And you know what? And he gave me a pass. Amen? God always gets us through those difficult tests in life. And you know what? That, that, that's, that's the way it is for life. Now, I wish we always made the right decisions, we don't always, but I tell you, Hezekiah did here. And he brought it before the Lord. Look at verse 35. I love this. It came to pass, verse 35, that night that the angel of the Lord went out and smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred and four score and five thousand. That's a hundred and eighty-five thousand. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. 
I love the wording of that. They woke up dead. You with me here? They woke up in the morning and they said, oh, we're not alive anymore, we're all dead. No, that's not what I mean. I mean, when Israel woke up, okay, when Judah woke up, they saw all the Assyrians were dead. God fought for them. I want to tell you something. Brethren, when we're overwhelmed, when we can't fight for ourselves, when we bring before God and say, God, I'll do whatever you want me to do, oftentimes God will do the fighting for us. I'm just glad about that. That is so encouraging. It's so encouraging. But unfortunately, uh, although he was encouraged by Isaiah and he was miraculously overcame in Syria, he didn't always do what was right. And uh, 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 13, the Bible tells us, verse 1 of 2 Kings chapter 20, he was sick, and Babylon sent ambassadors to say, hey, how are you doing? When he recovered, and uh, Hezekiah, what did he do when the ambassadors came from Babylon? What did he do? Do you remember? showed off his wealth. Do you remember that? 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 13. And Hezekiah hearkened unto them and showed them all the house of his precious things, the silver and the gold and the spices. I don't know what he's proud of because he already gave half of it away to the king of Assyria. Do you know what I'm saying? So he's shown off what he has left, the gold, the spices, the precious ointment, and all the house of his armor. That's like David numbering the army, isn't it? The greatest Men of God can make some serious mistakes. Are you with me here? And all that was found in his treasures, and there was nothing in his house, nor in all his dominion, that Hezekiah showed up not. And you know what? That was a big problem. Why was that a big problem? Does anybody remember? What would happen in the future? I think the prophet came to him that all what he showed that uh, in their service, and I told him it's going to be stolen or be robbed. Yes. So Babylon came and sent the ambassadors. Now, Assyrians would be, would be out of the picture, but years later, Babylon would say, hey, we have a map of Jerusalem. We know what's there. Do you understand what I'm saying? So by showing off his wealth and showing off all these things, they knew what to come back for in years to come. So Isaiah rebuked Hezekiah for this first act. He then prophesied that the days would come when Babylon would return and carry away all the temple treasury, as well as the princes of Judah, 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 12 to 19. We don't take... We won't take the time to read all of it, but let's quickly go to 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 12. It says here, and at that time, that big name, the son of Baladan, King Babylon sent letters in the presence of Hezekiah. We heard it, Hezekiah was sick, we saw that. And um, the Bible says that um, Hezekiah was told by the prophet that Isaiah, verse 14, told him, and he, he, he said, Behold, verse 17, the days will come that all that is in thine house and that which thy fathers have laid up in store unto this day shall be carried into Babylon and thy sons, verse 18. But look at verse 19. This troubles me a little bit, Hezekiah's response. Now, let me say, Hezekiah was a great man of God. I'd love to be in around during his days. He was a great man of God, a great deal regard him. But even this great man of God comes out with a wrong answer here. Look at verse 19. Then said Hezekiah unto Isaiah, Good is the word of the Lord which thou hast spoken. And he said, Is it not good if peace and truth be in my days? Mm -hmm. Ugh, that's a sting, isn't it? He should have said, I have sinned. I was wrong. God, is there any way that I can find favor with you? He didn't do that. He said, Well, least it won't be in my day. <laughs> not a good response. Brethren, great man of God, love Hezekiah wrong response. I think there's a lesson to learn. Don't be a naysayer. Don't be one of those people, well, at least it doesn't won't impact me. You know, don't be one of those people. Be compassionate. And if there's anything you can do to be a blessing to help others, or to change their circumstances, or bless their future, do what you can. Just don't be one of those naysayers, well, at least it doesn't affect me. Do you understand what I'm saying? That was one of those, ugh, with Hezekiah. And I greatly regard Hezekiah, but unfortunately, that was the wrong response. Although Hezekiah was a godly king, his son Manasseh um, would follow him, and he was exceedingly wicked. Now, um, I'm just trying to see if I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, yes, okay, let me just say this quickly. I, I'll just deal with this quickly. His son Manasseh was exceedingly wicked. He undid all the reforms of his father, had made and re-established idolatry in Judah. And the Bible says Manasseh did worse than all the kings that were before him. 
and he made his children to pass through the fire. He was a wicked king. Second Kings chapter 21, verse 10 to 12, uh, it says that it was Manasseh's wickedness that led Babylon to go in, or to come and get um, bring Judah into captivity. God was so angry at Manasseh. To the extent of his wicked deeds are recorded in 2 Kings chapter 21. But I want to tell you something, I want to end on this. Even though Hezekiah's son Manasseh was so wicked, God is gracious, God is merciful, God is kind. And even though his, he was so wicked, the conversion of Manasseh is recorded in 2 Chronicles 33. Let's turn there as we close. This is the mercy of God. Brethren, this, you, you might as well be looking at the conversion of Hitler. You might as well be looking at the conversion of Adolf Hitler. That's how wicked Manasseh was. You understand what I'm saying? But I want to tell you something. God is so wonderful that he's going to reach down from heaven and, and bring mercy to a man who's done so much evil in his nation. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles 33 verse 10, And the Lord spake to Manasseh and his people, but they would not hearken. So it's not just Manasseh's the people. Wherefore the Lord brought upon the captains of the host of the king of Assyria, which took Manasseh among the thorns and bound him with fetters and carried him to Babylon. And verse 12, when he was in affliction, he besought the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly. This is recorded in Chronicles. It's not recorded in Kings or in Isaiah. There are three passages that deal with Manasseh. And this is the only place you see it, this conversion. Okay? And verse 12, when he was in affliction, he besought the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers and prayed unto him. And he was entreated of him, of him and heard his supplication and brought him again to Jerusalem and his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord he was God. Wow. Are you not impressed with the mercy of God? Amen. Aren't you glad that the Lord reached down from heaven and touched your life? Amen. And if he hasn't, you need to be saved. You need to be converted the way Manasseh was converted. And Manasseh was wicked. He was evil. And God reached down from heaven and turned his life. Praise God for his mercy. Manasseh took away the strange gods. He put idols in the house of God. He took them out. And he repaired the altar of the Lord, verse 16, and sacrificed peace offerings and thank offerings to the Lord. And he commanded Judah to serve the Lord God of Israel. But it was too late. The damage was done. There was nothing Manasseh could do to reverse it. He'd done too much harm. And he is recorded in history as a very wicked king. His conversion is only recorded here. Thank God for his mercy. So just remember that. No matter how wicked people are, God is even more gracious. And he won't circumvent the will. There are people who have never done half, who haven't done half, or a third, or a quarter, or a tenth, or a millionth of the wickedness of Manasseh who are burning in hell today because they didn't repent. And you look at wicked Manasseh because he responded to the Lord and the grace and the goodness of God, he gets eternal paradise. And he didn't deserve it, did he? But neither do we. Let's thank the Lord for his grace. Father, thank you so much for...